Welcome in everybody to another edition of my roster review series with a look into the 2022 Winnipeg Blue Bombers coming off back-to-back -back Grey Cups. What is next for the Blue Bombers? We'll talk about all of that in today's video. But really quickly before we get started, as always, the best way to support the channel is by hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me out everybody and I would really appreciate it. And with that said, let's talk about today's agenda. First, we're going to talk about Winnipeg's 2021 recap, what happened to them last year, then talking about their coaching staff, the main coaches that are going to be the decision makers for this team this year, then looking at their 2022 positional rankings, where every position on this team stacks up relative to the rest of the CFL, then looking at their starting lineups, where all those pieces fit in, and then finally looking at the team award predictions and a key storyline to look out for for this team. And with that in mind, let's talk about the Blue Bombers 2021 season. And it was quite a dominant showing, honestly. And their 11-3 record that they finished with in the regular season really doesn't even do it justice. They were 11-1 through the first 12 games of the season and basically sat their starters the last two weeks of the season for the most part and lost those two games. And then when it came to the playoffs, yeah, they had a little bit of a shaky game against Saskatchewan in the West Final, but then... In Hamilton, they were able to uh, you know, come back in the second half and, and really finish the deal on what was a great season for this franchise and defending the Great Cup successfully. A lot to be proud of last year for Winnipeg, and I'm really excited to see how they follow that up and if they can go for three this season. Now looking at the coaches that they're going to be bringing into this season, starting with head coach Mike O'Shea, who was one of the first building blocks to this franchise's revival about a handful of years ago. They just slowly started to build. I think he had a bad first season. And then ever since then, the results have just gotten better and better for this Winnipeg team. And honestly, the last two years have just been such a reward for all of that patience. And O'Shea actually has a background in special teams. He, of course, was a dominant linebacker in the CFL as well. But the background in coaching is on special teams and O'Shea does a really good job with this organization and he brings together a good staff here with offensive coordinator Buck Pierce, former great all-star quarterback in this league at times and he did a really good job taking over from Paul Apolis last season. Big shoes to fill but I thought he filled them admirably or even improved on what they were doing in 2019. And then Richie Hall, an excellent, experienced defensive coordinator here who's been around the league for a long time. And then finally, special teams coordinator Paul Boudreau rounds out the unit. And it's one of the best staffs in the entire CFL. Really excited to see what they can do and continue to do this season. Now looking at our first positional group with the quarterbacks, which is going to come in at first in the CFL. And this really shouldn't surprise anybody because... Zach Claris was basically the only quarterback in the league last year that had a good season statistically, and he was rewarded by winning the CFL's Most Outstanding Player Award. He's just a quarterback with very few weaknesses, in my opinion. One thing that really stood out, though, for me last year was his mobility and his ability to extend plays. You saw that a lot last year, and a lot of Winnipeg's best plays on offense and when he was kind of scrambling around there, I know they have a great offensive line, which we'll talk about, but the plays that he did get pressured, he did a really good job at improvising and making those off script plays. And I really didn't see that too much in the previous years from him. He showed that a lot earlier in his career with Hamilton, but he was really back to that true MOP form that we saw back in, what was it, 2014 with Hamilton, where he got injured halfway through the season. And then Calaris really just put it all together last year, staying healthy. And that's been a big thing with him as well. Battled a lot of injuries throughout his career. And he was finally able to stay healthy last season. But that being said, you got to be wondering if he can stay healthy for this year, given that last year really was the outlier in his career in terms of staying healthy. Which brings us to the backup quarterbacks here. And you have a couple guys in camp, starting with Dakota Prukop, an athletic passer that has been on multiple CFL rosters the past few seasons, but has looked very raw as a passer in limited opportunities. However, Prukop's athleticism and general size gives him an opportunity to make the roster here as kind of that short yardage quarterback that teams like to use. And then Drew Brown, a guy that the team looks to like a lot. He has seen a ton of action in the preseason the last couple of years. Sorry, no preseason last year, but 
in the preseason this year. He's seen a lot of action and he got a little bit of run at the end of the regular season last year when they were sitting Calaris. And I think he is the guy that if there's an injury here, he could potentially start over Prukup, even though Prukup is the more experienced CFL guy, technically. And then finally, rounding out this unit with Joe Mancuso, a rookie from the University of Richmond. We'll see if he makes an impact here, but ultimately, you wonder if Calaris can stay healthy, but as of right now, you really can't argue that he's the best quarterback in the CFL. Now looking at the interesting group of running backs that they have, which are going to come in at 7th in the CFL, and it's an all-Canadian affair here in terms of the experienced guys in this room. Starting with Brady Oliveira, a well-rounded young runner who had a couple of big performances in 2021. He also displayed an ability to catch the ball out of the backfield and has good change of direction quickness. In my opinion, he'll need to improve his decisiveness when hitting the hole, but he already looks like a starting caliber player and they should be very comfortable starting him at times this year. And then the other half of this tandem here with Johnny Augustine, who's more of an explosive runner than Oliveira, who excels on stretch runs off tackle. For Augustine, it's all about sample size, as in the opportunities that he's received in the CFL so far, He's looked excellent. I think he's averaged over six yards per carry, but he just hasn't seen that many of them. So we'll see how that translates into a bigger role this season. And then the third guy here is Mike Miller, who is one of the league's all-time best special teams players, all-time leader in special teams tackles in the CFL, but not going to be a contributor really on offense. Now, in terms of the rookies, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail in this video just because a lot of these guys are going to be cut by the time people see this videos because I believe the cut down date is Saturday night. But some of these guys will still be around by then and make the final roster for this team. So the rookie running backs that they have, starting with Kyle Borsa, a rookie out of the University of Regina who brings speed and quickness to the table. Winnipeg featured him a ton in their preseason games this year, and I'm excited to see what he can do here as a third option. Greg McRae, the lone American in this backfield who plays college football at UCF. Connor Burtonshaw, a fullback type out of Queens who played five years for the Gales. And then finally, Antonio Belfano, a member of the 2021 Banya Cup Western Mustangs. But overall, we'll see what happens if any of these guys are still around. I definitely expect Borsa to make the roster, though. Now looking at their wide receiver room, which is going to come in right in the middle of the CFL at 5th. And I think you have enough weapons here. I think the chemistry is still good. Even though you've lost a few pieces this offseason in Darvin Adams and Kenny Lawler, I think they did an okay job replacing them with a guy like Greg Ellingson, who we'll talk about right now. He's an experienced, well-rounded receiver who's been the mark of consistency at the position the last five seasons. What helps Ellingson succeed is a combination of savvy route running, good hands, and above average athleticism. He's kind of sneaky athletic. He's not one of those guys that you look at and you think, oh, this guy's a burner, but he can beat you deep and vertical down the field. And while he's coming off a disappointing year in Edmonton by his standards, he should slide right into a prominent role here in Winnipeg, and I'm excited to see what he can bring to this offense. And then Nick Dembski, the Canadian here, a pure slot back who had his best receiving season in 2021. Dembski is excellent at using pre-snap motion, including taking jet sweep handoffs like a running back. However, he really evolved as a receiver last year, winning matchups further down the field while continuing to be a great yards after the catch threat. Because of the unique skill set that he brings to the table, I consider him the top Canadian receiver in the league going into this season. And then a guy that made my breakout candidates list in Rashid Bailey, who's been an underrated contributor to the Bombers' success the past two seasons. He will likely have a bigger role here in 2022, and he showed flashes of producing in multiple ways, whether that be on crossing routes, contested catches, or with his route running ability. Bailey has played most of the last two years in the slot, and he's expected to be moved to the boundary side position after the loss of Darvin Adams in free agency. Going to be interesting to see how that affects his production, and he should see a higher volume of targets there. And then Canadian Drew Wallatarski, a consistent starter at the field side wide receiver position, who always seems to come up with big catches in big spots for this team. Wallatarski isn't a speedster by any means, but has really good size and very reliable hands. 
Ultimately, when people talk about the Bombers and their success the past couple of years, I think Waltarski is a very underrated part of that. And then second year player Kelvin McKnight, who didn't show too much when he was pushed into the starting lineup as a rookie. McKnight is more of that faster, shiftier type receiver at 5'9", 189 pounds, and we'll see what he can do in his second year in the CFL if he stays around on this roster. And then Janarian Grant, who has mostly featured as a kick returner throughout his CFL career, but may have found more of a role on offense this season with the pieces they lost in free agency. Very excited to see what he can do this year. And then finally, Brandon O'Leary Orange, a former fourth round pick in 2020 out of Nevada, who dressed for three games as a rookie. We'll see what he brings this year in a pretty thin, in terms of depth, Canadian receiver room. So overall, I think it's a pretty good unit. You got a couple of really good Canadian players in here. You have Ellingson, who in theory should be your number one guy with what he's been able to do in the CFL over the years. And I think Bailey is a candidate to produce even more than he did last year. Now a quick look at their wide receiver rookies, starting with Blake Jackson, a former member of the Houston Roughnecks in XFL 2.0 in 2020. Dalton Schoen, a 6'1 receiver out of Kansas State, who was reportedly impressed so far in training camp this year. Tavares Harrison, who played his college football at Florida Atlantic University. Then Lucky Jackson, a superstar at Western Kentucky with an incredible 94 reception senior season. Antonio Nunn, who had solid production in his time at the University of Buffalo. And then finally, TJ Simmons, a former West Virginia Mountaineer who was last with Tampa Bay in the NFL last season. Now let's take a look at this team's offensive line, which is going to come in at first in the CFL. And frankly, this team has two dominant tackles and really solid play on the interior and honestly I think it's in a tier of its own right now in the CFL and what really helps them do that is a player like Stanley Bryant who has been this league's most outstanding offensive lineman three of the past four seasons including 2021. He's the most well-rounded lineman in the entire CFL as a brick wall pass protector and a nasty run blocker as well. He's just been so consistent year after year dating back to his time with Calgary Obviously, when he signed with Winnipeg, that was such a big free agent addition for this team. And, and he's really been a tone setter for this entire offensive line ever since he's gotten here. And then his partner on the other side, Jamarcus Hardrick at right tackle, who has become a dominant starter, in my opinion, as the league's top run blocker. What I like about Hardrick is he isn't afraid to get nasty when finishing blocks on the edge and has developed into a very nice pass blocker as well. He wasn't as good at that in 2019. In 2021, you saw a major improvement in that. And I think when you're talking about the best tackles in the game, you have to still mention him because I think he's just a dominant force as a run blocker. And the fact that he's not a liability as a pass protector, he's become a very good pass protector, is what makes him one of the best tackles in the league. And in my opinion, the best right tackle in the CFL going into this season. And then Michael Couture, a consistent starter at center the past two seasons. Couture is just a really well-rounded center who also showcases a lot of mobility in his game as well, which allows him to be a force on stretch runs and screens. And I honestly felt like he was one of the players that was snubbed from the West All-Star team last year. It was really unfortunate. Obviously, Sean McEwen in Calgary is an excellent center as well. But I think Kachero was just as important to this offensive line as a lot of these other guys that they had starting here. And all the other players on this offensive line got nominated with a West Division All-Star nod. So Kachero is a guy I really like. And I think he's one of the most bright young linemen in the CFL. And then Patrick Newfeld, a veteran guard who is nasty as a run blocker, bringing a lot of sandpaper to this offensive line. Newfeld had some issues in pass protection at times last year, but to me it didn't show up enough to be too much of a concern going forward. However, one thing with Newfeld is he's always battled injuries throughout his career and hasn't participated very much in training camp up until this point, to my knowledge. So, you know, keep an eye on that and how that develops on this offensive line. And then Jeff Gray, a 27-year-old who has been waiting in the wings the past couple of seasons and is projected to start now after the departure of Drew Delorier to the NFL. Looking back to 2019, he saw some starts but wasn't overly impressive to me. But I will say he has great size at 6'6", 300 pounds, and it will be interesting to see if he can take hold of that, presumably the left guard position this year in Winnipeg. And then not too much to say about these last three guys here. 
Eric Lofton, a veteran journeyman who has played in six total CFL games across three CFL seasons, likely doesn't make the roster here, but may stick around on the practice squad. Chris Kolonkowski, a veteran of four CFL seasons who has never started a game. At 30 years old, I don't think he is going to be a threat to start at this point. And then finally, Drew Richmond, who played in and started one game for Winnipeg last season and played his college football at USC. So ultimately, I think this is by far the best unit in the CFL with those two elite tackles like I mentioned. Now let's take a quick look at their offensive line rookies. You have Liam Dobson, who was the team's first round pick last year out of Maine, and was actually signed in the USFL earlier this year, but due to a work visa issue, something that the USFL didn't make enough money to you know, qualify for uh, a work visa, ultimately he actually ends up getting that contract voided, and he ultimately ends up signing here in the CFL. So a big win for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, getting one of their key prospects to sign here in camp. And then Pat Allen, a 6'5", 313-pound lineman from southeastern Louisiana. Dennis Bardwell, a 23-year-old who played at Houston. Cameron Durley, a huge lineman at 6'6", 315 pounds. Tamoya Machino, a global from Japan who only started playing football in college. Jalen Burks, who played at Wisconsin Stevens Point University. And then finally, Ben Coswara, a player who has been around the organization in the past but hasn't played in a CFL game. Ultimately, I'm really excited to see what happens with Dobson this year, but I really don't know if ultimately a lot of these guys are going to end up being on the roster by the time you guys see this video. Now taking a look at their defensive line room, which is going to come in at first in the CFL, and I think similar to the offensive line, they're elite on the edge. They're really dominant in terms of their edge rushers. They're pretty good on the inside as well, but it's those edge rushers that are going to rush the passer and make a huge difference for you in the CFL game that's very dependent on passing. And I think that this is the best defensive line room in the CFL. And let's start talking about these guys, starting with Willie Jefferson, a freak athlete at the defensive end position with long arms and elite agility for the position. Jefferson has become one of the league's biggest matchup nightmares, as teams often have to slide additional protection over to the side that he's on to slow him down. And the best way I can describe it is he's quite simply a far superior athlete than any of the offensive linemen that he goes up against. And that gives him just a massive advantage to wreak havoc every game. And that's ultimately why he is one of the best players in the league today. And then his partner on the other side in Jackson, Jeffcoat, who is an excellent player in his own right. Jeffcoat was a dominant force last season, being among the lead leaders in sacks and led the entire CFL in forced fumbles. I would say he's a better run defender than Jefferson, as his game is more based on physicality. Jefferson's more of a finesse speed oriented defender, but ultimately Jeffcoat is one of the top five edge rushers in the CFL right now in my opinion. So you have two of the top five guys in one unit. What an unstoppable pass rush those two guys combined to make. And then on the inside you have Jake Thomas who's a longtime member of the Blue Bombers who has been a steady presence at defensive tackle. He was very productive in 2021 like he usually is, producing four sacks while still providing great value as a run defender. Just a very dependable player and one of the few guys that you feel comfortable starting as a Canadian on this defense. And then Casey Sales, an intriguing second year defensive tackle who likely slides into the other starting spot beside Thomas. He was very productive in his first CFL season, producing five sacks and 28 defensive tackles despite not always starting in the unit. I didn't mention him in my breakout candidates video, but he's definitely a candidate for a big breakout this year. And then these last three guys, not too much has been proven about them, starting with Ricky Walker, who's a second year CFLer who appeared in seven games last season and had eight tackles. Let's see if he's part of this rotation, if he makes the team. Alfred Green, who dressed for four games as a rookie last season after being BC's fifth round pick in 2021 out of Laurier. And then finally, Cameron Lawson, who comes over to Winnipeg via draft day trade with Montreal. He was the Alouette's second round pick in the 2020 CFL draft out of Queens and might be a potential guy to develop behind Thomas at defensive tackle. But overall, those dominant edge presences combined with the just solid ability that Jake Thomas provides you on the inside. Casey Sales, like I said, breakout candidate. I think this is the best defensive line in the CFL. Now taking a look at their defensive line rookies, 
Starting with Cole Adamson, a mid-round pick in this year's draft at Manitoba, so a hometown guy there. We'll see if he makes the roster. Cedric Wilcots, an impressive player in the club's most recent preseason game. Rossini Sanjong, I'm sorry if I butchered that. He was a four-year standout with the York Lions. Kenneth Randall, who most recently spent time with the Jacksonville Jaguars in the NFL in 2021. And then LB Mack, who played at the University of Rhode Island. Don't see too many football players coming out of Rhode Island. But anyway, we'll see if any of these guys make an impact this year. Now taking a look at their linebacking core, which is going to come in at fourth in the CFL. And you have a great superstar player here, one of the best players in the entire league. And then I think you have another really good starter here. But then I think that strong side linebacker position is a major question, and I'll explain why. So we'll start talking about this group with Adam Big Hill, who's a three-time most outstanding defensive player, who is really in a tier of his own in terms of the best middle linebackers in the CFL. What really separates Big Hill, in my opinion, is his coverage range and instincts in pass defense. He's basically a safety back there. You combine that with the strong physical presence that he overall has when he's on the field, and he's one of the best players in the entire league today. And then Kyrie Wilson, a very good starter at the weak side linebacker position, who isn't necessarily a star. He struggled to stay healthy last season, playing in only seven games, so that's something to watch out for this year. But when he's in the lineup, he's a well-rounded linebacker that you can trust. And then in terms of the strong side linebacker possession here, you have Mercy Maston, who is a very promising player. But unfortunately, he just suffered a second straight torn Achilles in training camp. So that's really unfortunate about Maston, just so heartbroken for him. And it brings up a lot of questions about what's going to happen with this strong side linebacker position this season and who's going to end up starting there. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. And then Jesse Briggs, a Canadian who worked his way up through his work on special teams and saw an increased role on defense last season starting in six games. We'll see if he has more of a role or if, you know, maybe they decide to start a Canadian linebacker this year. He might be your guy. And then Malik Clements, who spent his rookie season with Edmonton, where he started two games and had 11 tackles. Shane Gauthier, a longtime Blue Bomber who has been a beast on special teams for years. He's a guy that even worked himself into some defensive packages last season, so we'll have to see if that continues. Les Morrow, a global from Japan who played a special teams role as a rookie in 2021. Tanner Codwell-Ladder, an undersized linebacker out of for Laurier, who got in on the linebacker rotation briefly as a rookie, but mostly played on special teams. And then Eric Mezzalira, a CFL veteran who should be expected to play a special teams role, but not much else last season. He's kind of been around the league for a while. So ultimately, you have one of the best players in the league in Adam Big Hill, a very good starter when he's healthy in Kyrie Wilson, and then a major question, what's going to happen at that strong side linebacker position? Now, there's actually no linebacker rookies for the Blue Bombers still left in camp from my count. So we're going to skip right to the defensive back room, which is going to come in at third in the CFL. And frankly, I think if they didn't have the injuries that they do, they would be even ranked a spot higher. But there are still some talented players here, starting with Dietrich Nichols, who was one of the league's top rookies from 2021 locking down the halfback spot in Winnipeg secondary. Nichols was incredibly effective playing one of the toughest spots in the secondary, often covering one of the opponent's best receivers. And honestly, I was impressed enough by Nichols to have him as my number one halfback in the CFL going into next season. And then you have Winston Rose, a star corner on this back-to-back -back championship defense who rejoined the team midway through last season and was a key contributor in the Great Cup run. Rose is very much a playmaker from that corner position, aggressively jumping routes very often. Sometimes he gambles and misses, but you live with it because his play otherwise makes up for it. So you have a really good top two guys there that are presumably going to hold down the boundary side. And then Nick Taylor, a good veteran defensive back, who I came away very impressed with last season. Winnipeg was going into last season with some questions in the secondary after losing guys like Marcus Sales. So they needed veterans like Taylor to step up and he sure did last year. He's pretty versatile, he can play a little bit of corner, he can play a little bit of half, and I'm very confident that he'll play a big role again for this defense this year after what he showed in 2021. And then Brandon Alexander, an elite physical presence at safety, who is perhaps the hardest hitter in the CFL. I always compare him to Cam Chancellor, that former Seattle Seahawks safety who used to bring such a physical edge to that defense, and I think that 
Brandon Alexander really does the same for this unit. He makes this defense scary to throw the ball against in the middle of the field. And not having him, because he's got injured in the Grey Cup last year, they're not going to have him to begin the year, which is why I don't talk about him until the fourth player here. But ultimately, having him miss the beginning of the season could be huge for this defense, as again, he provides that fear factor. That being said, I really don't know how much time that Alexander is going to miss, but hopefully he's back soon because he's a player I really enjoy watching. And then Taekwon Glass, a veteran CFL defensive back who comes over from Montreal, where I felt he struggled last year. I think it could be chalked up to a one-off though because Glass has generally been a very consistent player otherwise in his CFL career. It appears just from looking at Winnipeg's defensive back depth that he's going to play a big role for this team this season and I think it could be a sneaky good free agent addition for this club. One thing I really like about him is his versatility. Similar to Taylor, he can play a little bit of halfback and corner and I think he's just about as good at both spots so I don't think he's necessarily a great corner, I don't think he's necessarily a great half back but I think he's a pretty good player at both positions and then Demirio Houston who played at four games at the end of last season let's see if there's a bigger role for him here Nick Hallett a third year defensive back who mostly played special teams but did have seven defensive tackles in 2021 and then his brother Noah Hallett a second year player that is mostly a special teams contributor as well we'll see if either of those guys makes a big jump in terms of their production on the defensive side this year. And then Retta Cramdy, a former second round pick of the Bombers in 2021, who dressed for seven games last season as a rookie. And then finally, Malcolm Thompson, who was under contract with Calgary in 2020 and dressed for two games for Hamilton in 2021. But that is really the extent of his CFL experience. But overall, if Brandon Alexander was healthy to begin the year, I definitely consider this the second best defensive back room in the CFL. But because of that major question, you know, they lost a couple of other guys. I believe, you know, obviously DeAndre Elford to the NFL. I think that third in the CFL is the perfect spot to put him. Now looking at their defensive back rookies, starting with Tyrell Ford, a remarkable athlete that lit up the CFL combine this past spring. He was a star at U Sports at Waterloo with his twin brother Trey, where he mostly played the cornerback position and a little bit of other defensive back roles. And he was also a very good kick returner, so keep an eye out for that. If this team, you know, needs a kick returner, he could potentially fill that role. He is a good enough athlete. And then Patrice Rene, a highly thought of prospect going into the 2021 CFL draft that played at the University of North Carolina and last year at Rutgers. Cedric Levine, a seventh round pick this year out of Carleton. Chris Cagino, a fifth round pick this year out of the University of Ottawa. Simon Chavez, a 5'11 defensive back out of the University of Guelph. Jamal Parker, a smaller defensive back at 5'8, 175 pounds, who played at Kent State. I'm really going to butcher this next one, but solely named Karamoko, a global who was born in Ivory Coast and was raised in France. Evan Holm, a former standard at the University of North Dakota. Jermaine Ponder, who has spent time with the Cleveland Browns and Pittsburgh Steelers, among other teams in the NFL, but has never appeared in an NFL game. And then finally, Donald Rutledge, who played his college football at Savannah State and Georgia Southern. So... Interesting group of rookies. Very excited to see what Tyrell Ford can do in the CFL this season as a guy that was very hyped up going through the draft process. Now finally looking at the worst position on this team in my opinion, and that's the special teams group, which is going to come in at dead last in the CFL. And I really don't know how I'm going to trust this kicker going into this season. Ali Mortada really struggled last year in the opportunities that he saw. He reportedly missed an extra point in the preseason game with the new hash marks being more aligned with the goalposts so that's not a very comforting feeling there to make me confident in this kicking room mark leggio i don't think he's the answer as their place kicker as he saw last season he really did not fill that role capably uh, he was pretty good as a punter though and then generi and grant the kick returner here who was really good in 2019, I believe he was a 2019 CFL All-Star as a kick returner, but he just wasn't very good last year, frankly, in the return game. So we'll see how he does this year, but ultimately I just don't have a lot of faith right now in this special teams unit. But don't worry, Winnipeg fans, I'll cheer you guys up with what I'm about to show you, which is their overall team ranks, which are going to be first in both offense and defense. And ultimately on offense, you're talking about having the best players at 
the two best positions in terms of importance with quarterback and the offensive line. You have a pretty good wide receiver core. Running back is the weakest position on that offense, in my opinion, but still very capable guys in those roles. And then on defense, you have you know, very solid back end of that defense, a superstar linebacker in the middle in Adam Big Hill, and then, of course, those superstar defensive ends up front in Jefferson and Jeffco. But now that we've taken a look at their roster, now let's take a look at their projected starters, starting on offense. And the questions I have with this unit start up front with that left guard position, Jeff Gray. You know, he's been a guy that's been waiting in the wings the last couple of years. It's probably going to be his job to lose but they do have first round pick from 2021 Liam Dobson now in camp and it's going to be interesting to see if he can push him for that job this season and potentially take it over like uh, Drew Delarle did to Gray back in 2019 where Gray was a starter for the beginning of that season and then Delarle really uh, took off and, and really took that job and ran with it so looking forward to seeing how that position sorts itself out and then in the receiving core, not a lot of questions except for that one spot, which I put Blake Jackson in there, but ultimately I think it's going to be one of those rookies that are impressing in training camp right now. I've heard that it was Bonfire Sports, the guys that I uh, watch a lot. They were saying that a guy like Dalton Schoen is a guy that's really been impressing, but don't know for sure who's going to start at that slot back position. And then in the running back room, it's really just going to be a rotational thing with Brady Oliveira and Johnny Augustine this season and I put Augustine in there because I do think he's a slightly higher upside running back but I think it's really close between those guys and a lot of action will be seen by both of those players and then on defense my main questions come in the back eight here obviously that strong side linebacker position with the injury to Mercy Mastin huge question there it's probably gonna be a guy that we've never heard of that is going to start at that position unless they move one of their vets down to the linebacking core but ultimately don't know who's gonna start there I referred to the bonfire sports way too early depth chart for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers so all the credit goes to them they have Rutledge as the next guy up behind Mastin in that spot so we'll see if he's the guy and then in the secondary, at the safety position, it's going to be interesting to see if they start a Canadian defensive back with the injury to Brandon Alexander. I have Nick Hallett in there as well, but, you know, I don't know if he's going to be the guy that's going to be starting in that position. Probably going to be, again, an unknown American, but who knows. And then Taekwon Glass, I only underline him because, to me, he just had a very poor season last year in coverage. And I think with this unit, you know, being such a win now team I don't know if he's necessarily going to hold on to the job the whole season if he starts to struggle but in general I think this is what you're going to see the team start out on defense to begin the year and with that said let's move on to the team award predictions and for most outstanding player I'm going to pick Zach Claris to repeat as this team's nominee for most outstanding player not going to reveal whether I have him winning the whole award again this year but Ultimately, I do think he's going to win this team's nomination. I don't see any wide receiver or any one wide receiver really dominating, putting up the numbers necessarily to win that award. And I really don't see, you know, a dominant performance by any of the running backs because they're going to have that production split. It could be a great defensive player that gets nominated for this most outstanding player. But ultimately, I think the safe option is just to pick the quarterback here. And then most outstanding defensive player, I think there's a lot of options here, but I'm going with Willie Jefferson at defensive end, and I think he's a candidate, once again, to potentially win the league's most outstanding defensive player. But again, it could be Adam Big Hill, who has won three most outstanding defensive players in the CFL. And then most outstanding Canadian, I'm going with their best Canadian receiver in Nick Dembski who I think is arguably the best Canadian receiver in the CFL right now. And, and I think he's just even getting better year after year in the CFL. And then most outstanding offensive lineman, I'm going with the man, Stanley Bryant, who has just been a mark of consistency at the position, even though I wouldn't be offended if you picked a guy like Yoshi Hardrick either. Now, finally, let's take a look at our key question. And it's going to be, can this offense replace Kenny Lawler, and Andrew Harris and the production that they brought to this team the past couple of years. I absolutely think they can. I don't think that, for example, the running back position, Augustine, Oliveira, I don't think either of those guys are as good in and of itself as Andrew Harris is. 
but I think collectively you can put together a pretty similar production to what you were getting from Andrew Harris and then similar in the linebacking core which I think Winnipeg's generally done things by committee last year a little bit different leaned on Lawler a lot but I think that even if Lawler came back, I don't know if he was ever going to put up as good numbers that he put up last year. Honestly, it felt like a, just a giant career season really for him, even though he is a very good player. It's just they are losses that I think this team can manage because they have such great play up front on the offensive line and defensive line that that is going to allow them such an edge in other aspects of the game. They're going to allow them to you know, develop younger receivers and potential future star receivers and running backs for this offense. And I think ultimately they're going to be able to overcome that and uh, win a lot of games this year. But with that said, that is going to be the end of today's video, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to thank each and every one of you for watching. Once again, my name is Jason. If you want to support the show, the best way to do it, as always, is by hitting like and subscribe. It really helps me out, and I really appreciate it, everybody. And with that said, be sure to let me know what you think about the Winnipeg Blue Bombers going into this season. Are they going to 3 -peat? It's pretty rare for that to happen in the CFL, but can they do it? I definitely think they can. I definitely think it's well within the realm of possibility, but you'll have to let me know in the comments section. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.